Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. The fairy swordfish was an aircraft out of time. Obsolete by the time it was called upon in the Second World War, it was an aircraft of contradictions. Kept in service because the replacement would have taken too much to build, the swordfish was thrown into battles where it performed admirably and also where it should never have been. Joining me today is author and historian Matthew Willis whose new book on the swordfish looks to delve into some of those contradictions and explain why it stayed in service while the aircraft that were intended to replace it, like the Albacore, never got to the front line in the numbers that the swordfish did. But before we get onto the swordfish itself, we have to look at the company that made it and the remarkable man at the head. Who was Mr. Ferry? Yeah, um, well, Charles Richard Ferry, who's the founder of the Ferry Aviation Company, uh, was one of the sort of pioneers of, of early flight in the um, in the United Kingdom. And he didn't, he wasn't quite in that sort of earliest phase. Um, but during the First World War, Ferry were building themselves up rapidly as a um, as, as a manufacturer of military aircraft. And right at the end of the First World War, they produced uh, the first of the three series. It's a Roman numeral three, and that's you know there, there was a whole sequence of these aircraft, which were these sort of general purpose reconnaissance bombing light bomber biplanes. Um, and it became a phenomenally successful aircraft. Uh, was used by both the, the navy and the the air force. And Charles Richard Ferry was was just one of these giant figures, you know, literally giant. He was hugely tall, and there's a uh, you know, we talk about the uh, the Duncan Mingus connection later, but uh, but there's a, a photograph of of him with with Duncan Mingus, who's not a short bloke, and he just looks huge. He just must have been this really kind of domineering character to be around, and he was with his company as well. He was it was during that era of aircraft manufacturing, particularly in the UK, where the the heads of these companies were essentially benign or not so benign dictators mm. and they they ran everything themselves um and this became a problem for ferry a bit later on actually when it was kind of trying to transition to something a bit more modern he was the drive behind it he was the motivation behind it um he, he was the sort of the, the strategist he wasn't particularly a designer or a, um, anything like that. He was a he was a businessman, and he hired people who knew what they were talking about to do the other stuff. And by the sort of mid nineteen twenties, uh, Ferry was was one of the biggest aviation companies around. Um, it, its main factory was, I think, the biggest factory in Europe in in the mid nineteen twenties. A biggest, wow. probably the biggest aircraft factory in the world. Actually, it was a really big really kind of rapid rise for an aircraft company it really established itself as a major player in in the uk and they sort of tended towards this sort of weird procurement loop for the fleet air arm wasn't it now at this time fleet air arms still part of the the royal air force which was came out of the the amalgamation of the royal flying corps world navy air service um, and it was sort of that thing that the the air marshals kept their fingers in to keep one over on the admiralty wasn't it so mm. what what sort of world does Ferry find itself when it's bidding for what become the, the TSR spec, the Torpedo Scout Reconnaissance, Strike Reconnaissance? Uh, spotter. Spotter, reconnaissance. there you go. Because they're, they're fighting this out with your, sort of your other favourite company, Blackburn. Ah, yes, Blackburn, and also Gloucester, who... Um, we Manufacturer of the, 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 the finest fighter aircraft of the world. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, because they had um, their big success by this point was the 3F, um, which was the the sort of culmination of that three series of biplanes that I mentioned before. And this was this had, had been in widespread service in the RAF and also with the Navy. And it was probably one of the few aircraft that was sort of saw really widespread service with both services at the time. And so they really had a stranglehold on the... Um, the sort of reconnaissance aircraft, light bomber side of things with the fleet air arm, which, as you said, was all, was run by the the RAF at the time, even though it was it had a lot of naval personnel and it, they were based on ships when they were embarked on carriers. 
but the uh, the air ministry, as you say, it, it, it had its um, organisational stranglehold over the service at that time, and that would change. But but that was the situation things were in. You got a lot of RAF pilots sort of rotating through the uh, the, the naval air service, and by the sort of by the beginning of the nineteen thirties. As I said, they they were it was them and Blackburn, as you mentioned earlier, which were the the sort of the main suppliers of aircraft to the to the fleet air arm, overwhelmingly. So a few other manufacturers had had a little, you know, little bit of success here and there, but it was it was overwhelmingly Blackburn and Ferry. Um, and at this point, they were coming into almost direct conflict because Blackburn had been the big supplier of torpedo aircraft ferry had been the big supplier of reconnaissance aircraft and just as the 1930s came along the service decided that they wanted to try and have fewer types of aircraft on board aircraft carriers because they had you know very limited numbers of airframes that they could that they could afford and that they could physically fit aboard aircraft carriers so someone had the bright idea of well what if we got an aircraft that could do both the torpedo job and the reconnaissance job and this suddenly meant that that uh, ferry was having to compete really quite strongly for the torpedo aircraft and it had never been that well it had never been successful it made put bids in before but it had never supplied one and at the same time it was developing an aircraft another reconnaissance spotter aircraft because so we say spotter what we mean by that is uh, spotting for the fall of shot for the Royal Navy's big guns. So it was it was the, the same job that the Royal Flying Corps had done in the First World War for the artillery, for the Army's artillery. So you fly, a, you buzz around in your aeroplane directing the guns right in radio contact with the ships to say left a bit, right a bit. It's a bit more complicated than that, but you know, that's so that was the that was one of the jobs. So when we say spotter, that's what we mean. So this aircraft was was having to be a reconnaissance platform, a gunnery spotter, and a torpedo aircraft. And uh, this process was a lot more convoluted. But by sort of 1933, the service was was certain that this was what it wanted, and it rolled up several previous specifications that hadn't quite worked out or that were part of the way through into a new specification for for this TSR, Torpedo Spotter Reconnaissance Aircraft. And this would kind of set the pattern for the Royal Navy's strike aircraft really for the next decade until jets came along. So Ferry had been trying to develop a new reconnaissance aircraft, but they had also been developing for the Greek Navy a development of this which could do everything. And it was a sort of general purpose aircraft that could drop torpedo bombs. It could do the reconnaissance thing. And it was very similar to the aircraft for the Royal Navy, but um, Ferry actually preferred it. And they said to the Navy, come and look at this aircraft we're developing for the Greek Navy. And the Admiralty was actually really keen on it, this sort of private venture aircraft for the Greek Navy. So this was bad for the Greek Navy because they never saw it. But the Royal Navy was now encouraging Ferry to, to... develop this do anything aircraft and this was what appeared um, and it was known as the fairy tsr uh, imaginatively so uh, and um, this appeared in march 1933 uh, and it, it first flies at, towards the end of march 1933 and everything seems to be going well it's got reasonably good performance for a type of that nature um, it, it can it, it's very easy to fly it's it's it seems very stable it can do all the jobs that are required of it and test uh, flights continue they change the engine from an armstrong sidley to a to a bristol one which which improves things somewhat then they start doing spin testing with the chief test pilot chris staniland in in september 1933 now, being an extremely stable aircraft it's quite difficult to make the tsr spin at all and and this is this was something that 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 uh was kind of found quite generally at the time with with aircraft that were designed for these sorts of roles you you read a lot of the test reports they're actually quite difficult to make them spin at all so why would it be important to make it spin uh because you need to make sure that you can get out of a spin Mm -hmm. um because when you're in combat particularly with a torpedo in the torpedo role this involves a lot of very hard maneuvering uh, because you're dodging 
Akak as it's coming up at you. You're um, trying to sort of maneuver as a, as a ship is maneuvering hard and you're trying to get into position for the torpedo attack um, and all sorts of things. So there's a possibility that by mistake, a pilot could push an aircraft a little bit too far beyond its um, aerodynamic capabilities, at which point it can begin to, to spin. And then at that point, you need to find ways to, you need to, to make sure that it can be recovered for a start, but then you also need to develop the, the techniques so you can put this in the pilot's notes. If you get into a spin, do this. It may seem sort of counterintuitive that, that, that you're trying to make an aircraft do something that you really don't want it to do, but the, the secret is to, you know, stop pilots doing that in the first place and make sure that, that it's not curtains once they do. But Stanilin finds that, that when the aircraft gets into a spin, he can't get it out. Um, and the spin becomes flat, which is kind of bad news for any spin, really. It means the aircraft is in quite a flat attitude and it's masking all its control surfaces as it's as it's spinning round. See Top Gun, people. Well, indeed. Yeah, absolutely. That's a pretty accurate um, description of, of what happens, actually, albeit in a slightly faster aeroplane. But... Um, after about 12 revolutions and trying everything he can, Stanlin realizes that, that uh, this is not recoverable. Um, he bails out of the TSR. It crashes. He's fine. But there's a, this would normally signal the end of the program. And you, you see this a lot, in uh, particularly in sort of pr- interwar aircraft, where they only have one prototype. Later on, they'll start to, to work around this by ordering multiple prototypes. And this would become the norm quite quickly. But in, in the, the 1930s, particularly with a private venture aircraft like that, you, you tend to start out with one prototype. There's a number of cases where you've got a single prototype crashes and bam, that's just it, the end of the program. Does it take too long to build a new one? It's just, it's usually the end. The The Navy has the, the Blackburn competitor, an aircraft called the Shark, which is which is a, a bit ahead of the, the TSR at this point. So this would normally be curtains for the program. But Ferry under its benign dictator, um, Charles Richard, is um, is really committed to the, the TSR by this time. They, they, they think they've got something good on their hands. They're really convinced by it, and they do something that, that, that very rarely gets done, which is that they commit to both improving the design and pro- producing another prototype in double-quick time, which they do. They redesign the aircraft. They improve its um, spin recovery by extending the rear fuselage, enlarging the tail fin and sweeping the wings back slightly. And they also, uh, they work on this prototype just flat out. And they're, they're doing things like in any part of the factory where there's space available, any workers who are not engaged on on something um, for, for, a, for a production order get put onto this work and they build another aircraft in seven months. Um, which is is really really quick for this this sort of time, for the redesign and the and the build. And this aircraft is known as the TSR two, not to be confused with the somewhat later TSR two, <laughs> which had a slightly less happy career. Um, but um, but Co- yeah, career. Um, I beg your pardon. Career. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we won't go there. No, um, that's the subject for another podcast, I suspect. Yeah, it, it'll um, come up at some point in the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it won't be me. Like and subscribe, about it. people. Ring the bell. All that business, and it'll it'll happen. <laughs> I get enough abuse as it is without talking about the other TSR two. But anyway, <laughs> the first TSR two was um, the fairy swordfish um, that we that we now know and love. It, it reappeared. It did its um, it did its trials. The the Admiralty was was fully sold on it, and it it was set to go into service in. Uh, beginning of 1936 let's deviate slightly before we get on to the swordfish in service because ferry's two test pilots are remarkable individuals so duncan mingus is you've written his biography but you've mentioned chris stanland now chris chris was killed a, a about a decade af- after the incident we've just described mm. but this guy was the dude really wasn't he because not only was he test pilot extraordinaire he was a handy racing driver as well check out our other podcast boundary of disaster for for more on our me and matt going on about motor racing but what tell us a little bit about chris because i think it's it's worth doing just to see that 
the men that Ferry entrusted these aircraft to in their early days. Yeah. Well, as you say, he was, I mean, he was a hell of a pilot. He was, he was one of the best sort of display and presentation uh, aerobatic pilots that, that there were at, at the time, bar none. He was absolute top of his game. Um, he was a hell of a racing driver. He raced a lot at Brooklands and he was a hell of an engineer and he developed his own car. Uh, well, he, he bought an, a Grand Prix Alfa Romeo and sought about improving this and developing it. And he, he created a car which by the time he'd, he'd finished with it, um, it was more or less just part of the chassis of the Alfa Romeo and the engine. And he called this the multi-union. And this was sort of one of the most successful uh races at Brooklands in that sort of immediate pre-war pre- period. Uh, and there's an account um, that I found of, of, um, of Duncan Mingus um, driving with, you know, who's, who, well, who's passenger to Chris in his Bentley when they were sort of driving from, you know, driving to an airfield somewhere. And Duncan found this absolutely terrifying. You know, he was dri- driving as he would on the racetrack, just on the public roads. And, um, you know, absolutely confident in his own skills. Um, and uh, sort of Duncan made the point that um, perhaps he wasn't fully taking into consideration that not every other motorist on the road had that same level of phenomenal skill over their vehicle. But, you know, they came to no harm in that in that respect. But yeah, I mean, he, he was just, um, both of them had been in the RAF in the Middle East in the, the sort of 19, in the late 1920s. Um, and that was their apprenticeship. That was where they'd, they'd sort of developed their abilities and skills. Um, both had, had developed as test pilots, really out of a love of test flying and, and sort of experimental flying and pushing the envelope. That was what, what drove them. So, yeah, I mean, these were, they were remarkable men. They were driven, confident, and, and very sort of self-motivated um, men who, who were the kind of men you can give a job to and just, leave them to it uh, and this was was very much the sort of fairy way at the time anyway of of, of delegating and and trusting things to talented individuals and it was dangerous work Duncan Mingus was he was at the time a pilot with the aeroplane and um, armament experimental establishment at Martlesham Heath so the sort of the, the RAF's premier testing and evaluation site and this was where they were developing all the weapons that would that would see the UK's air arms into the Second World War and um, one of Ferry's test pilots died testing a fighter aircraft called the Phantom and Duncan Mingus was given a a two-week period in which he was given an offer um, open for two weeks in which he could come and be a test pilot for Ferry's. And in this time, he had to extract himself from his contract with the RAF if he wanted to do that. And he had to consider, I'm stepping into a dead man's shoes. And he didn't hesitate. You know, it's just he knew that was part of the part of the work. It was basically entirely on Chris Stanlon's recommendation because Chris knew him from the uh, the ANAEE. And again, this was very much, you know, the, the style of the day is that there was no uh, no sort of no interview process, no, uh, no kind of application process. It was just, Chris says, you're the man. We trust that. Are you coming or not? It's, it's never what you know. It's who you know. But these guys knew, knew what they knew as well, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. On the one hand, it feels like old boys network kind of stuff. On the other hand, it, it was very much trust based on personal experience. And, you know, because there's a story that... Mengis got his role at the ANAEE through the Prince of Wales, the, the future Edward VIII. And this is, this is highly conjectural. It, it comes from him essentially bumping into the Prince of Wales after having flown him about in um, Sudan and um, been part of his party when, when the RAF was... Um, supporting one of one of the prince's safaris which was the kind of thing the the raf did back then and the prince says come and have dinner with me um and uh, talk about your career and uh, um he says well, what do you want to do next and duncan says well i want to be a test pilot because i've been in the raf for however many years and i've only flown you know four or five different types i'd like to fly you know a, a, a variety of airplanes and the way to do that is to be a test pilot 
so that's what I'd, I'd like to go to Martlesham. That's what I'd like to do. And uh, admittedly, it was a number of years later that uh, that, that Duncan got his, his posting to Martlesham. Um, but that's sort of the extent. And he, he never knew whether the prince had put in a word for him or not. Um, to be fair, you know, he, he was qualified. He was absolutely qualified for the role. But this was sort of the way things were done in those days. It was a little less formal, shall we say. So this was... Uh, yeah, and you know, just a little you know, word about some of the flying Duncan had done. He he was a, an expert aerobatic pilot as well. Um, when he'd been in the RAF, he'd he'd been part of an aerobatic team uh, in fi- Avro 504Ns, doing a, a crazy flying, as they called it, routine then, which was um, you know one of these sort of kind of aerobatics that that you probably wouldn't get away with now. That was sort of designed to 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 wow a crowd the sort of formation and synchronized aerobatics with with Avros. Um, So, you know, he was a very precise pilot, but, you know, they weren't reckless. You could say, actually, Stanilin possibly had a streak of recklessness. Duncan Mingus absolutely did not. He was absolutely, you know, you read some of his notes, uh, you read sort of accounts of the kind of flying he'd done. And, you know, he was absolutely all about safety and just everything was so systematic and he covered every single base before he, you know, before he even started on anything. And, um, and, you know, I think that was what made him such a successful test pilot. Uh, it's what made him so attractive to fairies. They knew that, uh, you know, he, he had a, a great sense for an aeroplane. Um, he, he was, uh, and he was very methodical and very systematic and, and, uh, you know, would not miss anything. And, uh, he was prepared to take the calculated risks that, that were required in, in flying new aircraft and aircraft that were under development and might not necessarily behave in a way you think they're going to in extremis. I can highly recommend, dear listener, Matt's book, Flying to the Edge, which is Duncan Mingus's biography, which you had access to the family files and there's some incredible photography that you've, you've, you've squeezed into that as well. But that's, we'll come back to that another time as well, because those are the gentlemen who behind the scenes are helping to work up the swordfish as it's now called, but also its successor, the albacore. So Mm. ferry not only has this aircraft going into fleet service, but they also have a similar ish, but more modern aircraft coming along the way. And then the war happens, which causes a very interesting production issue for fairies, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the timing of this could not be worse because they're due to phase out the swordfish, which, you know, is it's an early 1930s design. It, it stemmed from a design that, that, was, that, that started work in 1930. And it first appeared, it first flew in 1933 and, and you're first in service in 36. Uh, it's virtually obsolete. Everyone kind of appreciates that it's it's on the brink of of being obsolete. And they've, as you say, they've developed a newer type. Uh, it's got a more powerful engine. It's got some more modern features. It's got an enclosed cockpit, landing flaps. Um, it, it's an aluminium stress skin fuselage. It still has fabric covered wings, but you know, and a bit more modern equipment, things like that. It, it um, looks like a fancy swordfish, doesn't it? It looks like a fancy swordfish. Yeah. You know, they, they used to call it, the, the air crews called it a gentleman swordfish. Um, it, it was, um, you know, it was like a kind of, um, <laughs> you know, it was, like it was something sli- entirely different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Dirty it, mind playing up. Yeah, I know. I, um, but, um, yeah, I mean, it was... It was a modest step forward in performance. Uh, you know, it's a useful step forward in, in performance, particularly range. It had a lot longer range than the Swordfish. And the speed was, you know, usefully higher. It was considered as an interim step before something properly modern came along. And the production issue was was that they were due to phase out the Swordfish in production and bring in the Albacore just as it turned out as war broke out. And in the few months before the war was about to start and the government and the Admiralty were realising that there's a very strong chance that we're going to be at war towards the autumn of 1939 and realised that just when we might need a large increase in the number of airframes, we're going to get airframes delivered, dropping down to, you know, a, a small handful and then building up again. And reserves might not be enough. 
so they had to it's sort of two problems really one is that they needed to increase production of strike aircraft generally to cater for the expansion of the fleet air arm during wartime and also the increased number of airframes that they would need to, to counter wastage and also they would need to try and do something about this drop away of of airframes at the point when they need them most now to deal with the expansion issue they've already approached blackburn to see if they can set up another production line of albacores this being the the aircraft that they think they're going to switch to but this creates a problem because you're not going to be able to get those albacores until it's going to be a couple of years down the line before you've got aircraft coming off that production line. You're going to need Ferry to help with the new production line, just as they're trying to increase their own production. So someone has the bright idea of, well, instead of a new production line of albacores, what happens if we set up a second production line of swordfish that can take over from Ferry when Ferry start to build the albacore? And this has all kinds of advantages because the tooling that Ferry are using for the swordfish can be switched over to Blackburn. And so they won't need, they don't need to fully tool up. They still have to do a bit. And the factory that the, the Ministry of Air, Aircraft Production is, is building these new factories to a set design for expansion. So they can, they can deal with the factory. And there still will be a period when there aren't quite, there aren't that many airframes coming through, but the new ones will start to come through a lot sooner if you switch to if you if you set up that second production line of swordfish rather than albacores and this being a numbers game the fleet air i'm just it can't not have the airframes coming through and so it decides well we've got the better aircraft but we're going to lose out on you know we're, we're basically potentially going to run out of airplanes or we have the slightly worse aircraft but we know we've still got machines coming through. And that's the only choice they can make, really. So this sort of sets the seal on various things for almost the rest of the war. It means that the, the Albacore has a finite career because the plan is that that will be replaced by the new machine in time. But you've got a new production line of swordfish, which is almost sort of independent from the other, the other organization. Um, so that's their kind of churning out aircraft. And um, you can keep doing that for longer. And what Ferry tends to do, because Ferry has got two large factories, it's got one in the south and one in the north. What tends to happen is they kind of switch between them. So if you've got the an aircraft like the Fulmer fighter, for example, and that's going to be replaced by the Firefly, which is basically like a sort of modern, but slightly more powerful version of the Fulmer, and they build that one down in this. So they're building the Fulmer in the northern factory, but they're building its replacement in the southern factory. So you, you don't have to kind of stop and jump over quickly. You, you can be working one up while the other one's tailing off. Which also gets you around tooling issues because you don't have two lots of tooling doing the, doing the knocking around in the same factory, which takes up space and slows things down. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, it, um, it, it just makes things that much more practical. So, so Ferry will have to be... Um, Ferry can use both its factories to, to, to gear up for the, the Albacore's replacement, which is what will become the Barracuda, which no doubt we'll talk about at some point. Um, <laughs> uh, no way. Um, but yeah, it's... Um, In inside yeah. joke there, dear listener. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so so Ferry can keep on doing its own thing and, and developing the, the replacement to the replacement. But you've still got a stream of airframes coming along. So it, it, it deals with all. And this is another thing that I think that people don't quite appreciate with, with wartime production economy, which is you can't just switch things off and on. You've got to be building up and you've got to have the resources in place and you've got to have all the resources in place in the right place at the right time to actually get your airplane. Um, and this continuing to build what they already regard as an obsolete aeroplane is, is it solves a problem at the time and it will create further problems down the line but right now it solves their problem They've, they need x number of aeroplanes they will get x number of aeroplanes and that's the nature of the aeroplane is something we'll worry about at another time yeah which is why we don't see specific new types be developed during during wartime it's it's variations on a theme isn't it it's it's just too difficult and yeah. expedience expedience is needed because you know 
we're going to, we've talked about the build up. We're going to dive into the wartime service now because it's yeah. the swordfish is, is, is straight into action, isn't it? And we're, we're going to jump to, to Norway because I find Norway fascinating. It is cock up, but also lots of heroism through, through cock up. And one of the things uh, that's always fascinating me is how the fleet air arm are in the thick of it. And also in the thick of one of the biggest early disasters, the Royal Navy faces um, within that first year of war. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, they're learning on the job. And there's only so much you can do in peacetime to prepare for war. Um, you've got, you, you can do your kind of fleet exercises and joint service exercises and all those kinds of things. And they will throw up a certain amount of, a certain number of lessons that you can learn and work into things. But it's only when you, you get into the actual conflict that you start learning how to do things and how not to do things and this is very much where the fleet air arm is uh, and the royal navy in general is in 1940 um in early 1940s so it's april 1940 when germany launches a surprise invasion of neutral norway and denmark and the uk and france come sort of come to support norway and and try and resist this invasion which they are well ultimately unsuccessful and i think it's the the invasion of France and Belgium really knocks this on the head because the, there's no way they can continue fighting in, in Norway and and deal with the the Blitzkrieg in in, in France and Belgium. But it's it really from the start. It, there are odd successes, and there are like you say, there is there is heroism. There are a sort of victories in the face of defeat. But uh, the, the the swordfish. They're up there from the very beginning in HMS Furious, which is the the old the, the the Royal Navy's first proper aircraft carrier, which which goes up to the far north. And some of the stuff they're doing is really it sets the tone for a lot of what the, the Swordfish will be doing during the war, because it shows that the Swordfish can operate in absolutely appalling weather conditions, conditions that would ground ground many aircraft. The the Swordfish can can keep on flying through because it's an extremely tough airframe it's an extremely it's easy to fly it's very forgiving um, and it can keep going through sort of snowstorms and gale force wind and uh, very little visibility some of the raids they're doing in norway are sort of you know the, the the cloud base is incredibly low there's there's fog everywhere and they're having to try and fly up fjords and avoid running into mountains and things like that and uh, you know in gale force winds and it's it's incredible what they're able to operate in it's fair to say they don't have a great deal of success they do a certain amount to support the navy on the on the surface which is doing things like the battles of narvik where they're they're fighting german destroyers and flotillas of german destroyers in and out of the fjords and the swordfish are supporting them with bombing attacks and with with a bit of gunnery spotting for hms war spite when she turns up so they're they're kind of they're they're learning they're they're trying to do some torpedo attacks on um, on on German uh, warships sort of which are hiding out in the fjords and and again finding not having a great deal of success but learning a lot about what it takes to to make a successful attack which will pay dividends a little bit later in the war. We're just going to take a short break for a quick message from our friends. Hello folks, I'm Zach White, Chair of the Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves Charity. We're a new organisation that honours the veterans of the period 1775 to 1815. What many don't realise is that those who died in conflicts before 1900 are not covered by war graves commissions, meaning that many veterans' graves are lying in disrepair. But the problem is more serious than that, because plenty of veterans' bodies are being excavated but nobody is burying them. Instead, these war heroes' bodies are lying in cardboard boxes, their sacrifice forgotten. At the NRWGC, we're changing that, restoring graves and giving these veterans the dignity of a proper burial. So if you feel that the war dead deserve this basic respect, take a look at our website, www.nrwgc.com to find out more about our aims how you can donate, and the perks of being a member. Thank you. I think the sinking of Glorious needs a more time than we're going to give it. I think it's mm. it's it's mm. it would do it an injustice to to blow through it quickly. 
But you made an interesting point there that the lessons learned in Norway will be paid off reasonably soon because those lessons then get put to the test in the Mediterranean, don't they? And there's yep. a, an, in, an entirely enticing target sitting in Toronto Harbour, isn't there? Absolutely. Um, the the nature of the war has changed very quickly for the for the Royal Navy with the entry of Italy into the war in in uh, summer 1940, and also with with France really being on the the, the tail end of of their fighting. Um, they're about to surrender in in June 1940. So so suddenly the Royal Navy's got it's been up in the far north, and now suddenly it's it's got to go down south and and try and hold. The Mediterranean, and yeah, the the Italian battle fleet, which is a pretty potent force, really. It's on a much smaller scale than the Royal Navy, but they've got a much smaller neighbourhood to to deal with. And at the time, they have six battleships in service, four of them modernised First World War battleships, and and two brand new ones. Uh, and these are based at uh, Taranto in in southern Italy. And as you say, it's it's a pretty enticing target because Taranto is in many ways a very secure harbour. Um, it has an, an extremely secure inner harbour um, and uh, a, a sort of outer bay that, that that sort of you know the larger ships anchor in. And I think the the problem with for the for the Italian navy with Taranto is that the battleships have got too big to routinely get in and out of the inner harbour. So they're restricted to the outer harbour, which is much larger, um, much more open, much less sort of protected by the surrounding terrain, and much less, at this point, much less protected by all the kinds of things that, that navies tend to put in place to, to protect their warships in harbour. So things like torpedo nets, barrage balloons, anti-aircraft guns, those sorts of things. And... These are all things that can be put in place and will make it pretty well impregnable for the for the ships that are anchored there. But at this point in the war, the Italians are they've only just come into the war. It was not something they were really expecting to get involved in until um, Mussolini saw how um, how well things were going for Hitler and decided he wanted in on the action. So the Italian Navy is not in, as well prepared for, for being at war with the Royal Navy as it could have been. So they're still busy manufacturing torpedo nets, trying to put them in place, barrage balloons, make enough helium to put in the barrage balloons and, and you know manufacture anti-aircraft guns, modern anti-aircraft guns to go and put around this harbour. So it's kind of a juicy target. And the, the Navy manages to get uh, some, some good reconnaissance photos of this uh, this harbour. And the other important thing they get at the time is long-range fuel tanks for the swordfish, which enables them to, to fairly dramatically extend their range, which had not been available to them before. So they, they have a, a window of opportunity in which they can send swordfish to go and attack the, the Italian battle fleet in its harbour. And this sort of comes around in about the autumn of 1940. It's a fascinating attack. It's at night. Swordfish are dropping flares. They're making torpedo runs into heavy amounts of flak. Matt describes it beautifully in his Swordfish book, which is what we're, we're basing this conversation on. So we're, we're not going to tease it too much. But needless to say, it puts the, the, heav the heavier ships out of action for quite a while. You then have... Matapan a little bit later, which takes care of that takes care of the rest of it. Hmm. So it's 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 amazing that sort of a, of the Italian sort of battle fleet is is crippled by the new form of conflict with air power, and then the traditional heavy, heavy guns of the Royal Navy. It it's I've always found that really interesting that you have this moment where what we would then come to see again and again and again in the Pacific is also bookended with. A, what would be considered a classic naval encounter at, as well in the Med. It, it, I've always found that just an, an, an interesting um, quirk of fate. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's textbook in, in many ways. The, the Matapan in particular is is, um, is the fleet air arm doing exactly what it's de been designed to do, which is to seek out the enemy fleet at sea, hamper it, hamstring it a bit, so the, the, the Navy's big gunships can come off and come along and deal the deal the fatal blow 
and that's exactly what they're what they're intended to do, exactly what they're trained for, and that's exactly what they they achieve. Taranto is something slightly different in that it's it's a slightly more innovative form of attack, uh, kind of hitting the enemy where they don't expect to be um, hit in in a way that they don't that they're not fully prepared for, and uh, it, it knocks three battleships out. Uh, immediately, uh, one of them being one of the really modern ones, and they're they're all well. Two of the th- one of the three is is effectively knocked out of the war. The the modern one they throw everything at getting that back into service within a few months, um, and the 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 middle one is 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 kind of out of the war for the, about a year, I think. Mm-hmm. But um, it, you know, it, it knocks back the the Italian navy. They they have to sort of compromise how they're uh, how they operate. It, it robs them of some already slender resources that they've got, and it, it tips things in favour of the Royal Navy for for a for a time. And the pendulum will swing back for various with various things, but but at the time, and for it as a sort of morale boosting victory as well, it's it's really important. It's a sort of formative thing for the Royal Navy and for the fleet air arm, where they really show what they're capable of uh, and how they're sort of capable of not just being a sort of a slightly useful adjunct to the surface navy but but a really powerful weapon for it moving on dear listener if you were hoping for a detailed discussion of sinking the bismarck we're not going to do that um by matt's book his chapter on that is very good also recommend ian ballantyne's books on it which are very good as well but we're going to jump ahead to an encounter that pits the swordfish into an environment it should not really be in which is the channel dash where they come up against the Luftwaffe so well we're not going to delve into this too much I just thought it was interesting to touch Mm -hmm. on you know this is this is an aircraft really out of time but it's coming up against a modern fighter cover over its traditional target so as Sharon Horst Neisnow and and Pesugina are are, yeah Sneaking because they kind of got most of the way without getting detected. Cock up galore. Why were these mm. particular swordfish um, on the south coast when these ships were racing through to try to get away from Brest? Yeah, well, it, it was the Admiralty considered that something that was a, a possibility was that they would try and break through the channel and they would try and return from from Brest to Norway. And so there was a lot of preparations put in place for this. Um, and um, the presence of the swordfish was really just meant to sort of cover off a slight sort of a slight possibility that uh, that they might be crossing through the, the narrows at night. And this was one of the big failures of the British response to the Channel Dash was that, that they expected that it would happen at a different time of day that it, that it actually did. But the swordfish, and there were only there was half a squadron of swordfish based at Manston. Uh, they were still in training. They were not. They were they, they were sort of working up again after reforming, which was eight two five squadron. And um, half of their squadron was away further north, um, training and working up for, for for going back aboard a, a carrier. But this half of the squadron was volunteered for support during the operations, just in case the Sean Horse and Nice now would would come through during the night, and it wasn't anticipated that that they would ever have to do anything else. The the swordfish by this time they have ASV radar, which is um, extremely useful, and, it, and it, it does extend the swordfish's life useful life really quite dramatically, uh, because it means it can operate in conditions that that wouldn't have previously been possible in in um, visibility conditions during the day and at night. That quite simply it can locate a target that otherwise would have been hidden and this was the reason they were there there's a small number of you know half a dozen aircraft in the you know, nine aircraft i think it, it, it was considering all the, the many tens and tens of aircraft that were available for the raf the swordfish were just a tiny little part of this operation that was just meant to cover off a, a, a small possibility as it was for whatever reason none of the raf bombers and torpedo bombers were in a position to to carry out an attack on the battle cruisers as they sailed through the the narrow part of the channel and and out into the North Sea, uh, and this was as you say it was it was an it was an immense cock up it was an intelligence cock up it was an organisational cock up, it was a failure of communication between the services and also it, it what emerged later on was was a difference in culture between the the, the RAF and the Royal Navy and the Fleet Air Arm in particular that led to 
the the destruction of all of the swordfish involved in the organiz- in the the operation because they they went out at about midday I think it was um, as the ships were passing through um, attempted to make a torpedo attack really none of them got anywhere near the the enemy ships I think a couple may have got to the point of launching their torpedoes at extreme range with virtually no chance of of anything other than an extraordinarily lucky hit. And they were massacred by the, the Luftwaffe fighter umbrella and uh, the, the very strong anti-aircraft fire from the, the screening ships as well. It's, it's hard to know exactly. So, I mean, three of the aircraft just kind of flew on into oblivion and there's, no, there's not really any account of, of what, what might have happened to them. They just got destroyed. They were just lost. That's you know, all we know. The others were pretty much shot down by fighters, the flak kind of took its toll as well and, and that was that and it was never the kind of attack that that swordfish were really intended to be involved in they were supposed to have a they did have a fighter escort but they were supposed to have a much much stronger fighter escort and this was where the sort of cultural differences came in because the the RAF got to the point where they were briefed about what was going on they were trying to get together I think it was something like 10, 10 Spitfire squadrons to try and provide an escort um but most of them considered we cannot brief the crews and prepare the aircraft in the time that we have got, in the time that we've been given to rendezvous, therefore we're going to scrub the mission. And a couple of squadrons managed to, to, I think it was something like 10 Spitfires in the end, managed to um, rendezvous with the the swordfish. Don't quote me on that. Um, it'll be the, the correct figures are in the book. They're not in my head anymore. I apologize. Um, but it was, you know, about a squadron's worth um, of, of Spitfires actually made it. And, and they were almost immediately engaged with, with the Luftwaffe fighters and, and pulled away from the swordfish. And, and that was, that was the end of that. But there was a sense that the, there was in the inquiry afterwards, the, the question was quite rightly addressed why on earth were they sent out when it was pretty much certain death and this this again came down to the sort of cultural situation with the the royal navy where they were much more about taking whatever opportunity there was whenever it presented itself and uh, on the basis that the opportunities might not present themselves for very long so even if it's an extreme risk you know, you, you take the chance. Whereas the RAF were, were very much of an opinion that if, unless everything is in place for this mission to go right, we won't do it. And that's simplifying things a great deal, but that's partly what happened with the um, with the Channel Dash, that they couldn't, the Swordfish, because they're so slow as well, they had to really set off when they had to set off, or they wouldn't have even reached the, the, the ships before they were out of range. So um, they they were sort of expert, and obviously the longer it went on, the longer they waited for escorting Spitfires to turn up, the longer they would have been uh, exposed to the the fighter umbrella, because they were, as I say, they were engaged more or less the moment they within a couple of minutes of leaving Manston, they were under under attack. So it was a it was a massacre, really. It was it was hesitate to use the word murder, um, but it was pretty much murder. The person who was in ultimate responsibility is is quoted as saying, when when he was asked if this was sensible, sending these swordfish out, uh, replied to the effect of, the Royal Navy will engage the enemy wherever and whenever he is to be found. And that's all very Nelsonian and everything, but but you know it was it was pointless um, and um, it shouldn't have happened. But it it I mean. It, in a way, it highlighted the limitations of the swordfish, but in another way, they were never meant to have been in that kind of situation anyway. And even much more modern aircraft would would have would have been completely unsurvivable in that circumstance. So, um, you know, this is this is early 1942. It's an aircraft that was considered obsolete two three years earlier, and um, it, it was it's the uh, the nadir of the swordfish's service, unfortunately to say. But I think it says more about the the admiralty than it does about the aircraft, to be honest. I've always struggled with this, really, because it's been a month since the Japanese proved what essentially medium bombers can do against surface surface vessels in transit. You have the RAF flying ridiculous sweeps over France daily for very little reward. And they finally have 
this incredible target going straight through them. And there's just this complete disintegration of coordination. Not that there was a hell of a lot to start with, but yeah, th- mm, this, mm. this, yeah, of, of what should have been a terrible experience for the Kriegsmarine, but it's, it, it came off as, as one of the highlights. But anyways, well, we're going to, again, we're going to jump ahead, ladies and gentlemen, because the swordfish then sees incredible service in, in the Battle of the Atlantic, flying off of escort carriers, Mac ships, the, the, the converted merchant ships and things like that. But it's also doing this with its replacement and also with its American challenger, the, the Avenger, which is what you, you know, some would consider light years ahead of it. There's a great quote in, in your book, Matt, of um, Rear Admiral Dennis Boyd, um, when the purpose of still deploying the swordfish was, and he, he says, you say that the swordfish is obsolete. And this, of course, is perfectly true. Which you think, okay, where's he going to go with this? Uh, but it's having- Everything after but is yeah. unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> but it is having great success in the Battle of the Lake. And it's particular. I love this bit. It's pre- peculiar qualities of slowness and ease of landing make it an extremely useful aircraft for operation and auxiliary carry. Furthermore, it is easy to produce, and for this particular type of operation, armed with rocket projectiles, bring it on the RP-3, it is a formidable weapon and one which already the U-boats have caused to fear and dislike. You've mentioned the radar on it. It's being deployed in what we consider the ASR role now, and it's it's being used in conjunction with all these other types. It's... A very interesting swan toy. And it, it's interesting as mm. well because when you consider the types of aircraft that would then and still do hunt subs, they're not the fast, glamorous stuff. You know, I'm thinking uh, Gannett, I'm thinking, you know, P3, which is, you know, a souped up Lockheed Electra. You know, it, it's, it's this thing that there's this role that suddenly it finds a niche that sees it through to the end of the war. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think there are the, the two, well, the main advantages of it, it's there. There's the, the factory's open and it's churning aircraft out. As um, uh, as Admiral Boyd mentioned, it, it's easy to produce. So that's a big plus in its favour. And for a, for a wartime economy like Britain's, um, you know, one of the advantages of the swordfish from the back in 1939 over the Albacore was it uses less strategic material. Um, it's got a steel tube, um, fuselage frame and... Um, steel spars and so on that uses less a lot less light alloy which is a huge demand and you know blackburn's just there churning them out and they can continue to churn them out switching to another new type which would involve a fall in numbers so that's its advantage that's one advantage one big advantage it exists the other advantage is as was mentioned that it can operate in in bad conditions it can operate off a small deck it's it's easy to fly so you know, in, relatively inexperienced pilots can make a good job with it. It, it can carry a, quite a lot of weapons. Its load carrying ability is is certainly uh, overstated at times. Um, you know, but it can carry a wide variety of weapons: depth charges, rocket projectiles, um, you know, bombs of, of various descriptions, as well as all the, the kind of smoke floats and flares and all of those other kinds of things that are, are needed for that kind of um, that kind of operation. And, you know, it's easily repaired, um, it's dead simple, and, um, you know, it, it's good enough to do the job for the most part. And what's, I think what's most important in the convoys is making sure that your ships don't get sunk. It's not sinking enemy submarines, it's making sure that your convoys get through. That's the icing on the cake if you can sink the submarines, but it, it's not an absolute priority so the swordfish do sink a lot of submarines or they sink a number of submarines but the main thing is they keep the heads down of the submarines they put them in a position where as soon as they're sighted they have to submerge and that puts them out of position for for making attacks so that's where they are principally useful and they can operate from the small escort carriers. And then later on, you get the MAC ships coming along, which are the merchant aircraft carriers, which are the, the ships that are actually still functioning merchant ships carrying a cargo, either of grain or of oil, that, that have a flight deck built on top. And these are even smaller, a um, bit shorter and, and even narrower than the escort carriers. And the swordfish have to which, be adapted. Which is, which is saying something, because the escort carriers are very big. Yeah. I mean, they would... They were tiny um, uh, and um, 
Uh, and also, with, you have the, the disadvantage with the, the British-operated American-built escort carriers that the catapults aren't compatible with British aircraft, which is quite a big problem. And, and um, nobody really manages to adapt British aircraft for, for using American catapults until somewhat later in the war and too late, really, for, for this. But um, but then you also have the, the Ratog developed and the, um, using those rocket projectiles to actually fire the aircraft off the ship rather than um, you know, fire a rocket off the aircraft. But the ones for the Mac ships, they're fitted with Ratog and they also have um, a fine pitch propeller, which makes their top speed even slower than the normal swordfish. And, and it, it's <laughs> sub 100 miles per hour by this point. But it, it's just good for sort of hanging about, loitering above the uh, the, the convoy and just, just making sure that the, the submarines can't get into attack position at, at their leisure so it's it's doing that job it's, british it's, plug, for a, it's plugging the gaps in the air cover isn't it it's plugging the gaps in the air cover absolutely um and and it's fair to say it is a lot less successful at actually engaging the u-boats than the avenger i don't think there's any two ways about it and also it's the avenger has a lot less deck accidents it breaks a lot fewer aircraft the the, the british ones operating in the conditions that which to be honest they are operating in in worse they do tend to be operating in worse weather conditions than the american escort carrier groups but still you know even then they're breaking a lot of undercarriages just because the, the swordfish undercarriage isn't as strong as the the good old grumman you know, long stroke that you can sort of drop this massive aircraft on them and it'll just kind of rebound a bit. And then yeah. that was the one thing that Grumman did absolutely brilliantly was build aircraft, um, uh, build undercarriages for, for carrier aircraft. I think the British at this point in the war, they overestimate the, um, for a while anyway, they, they sort of overstate the suitability of the, the swordfish for, this task, and I think they're they're kind of somewhat taken aback by the the success of the Avenger in this role, and I think it sort of takes them a bit by surprise that that, that a modern, relatively high performance aircraft can not only do the job as well, but actually better and um, and is 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 a bit more reliable and um, and less prone to, to breakages. And I think they, they sort of there was a sense that if you've got a sort of a slow flying, lightly loaded biplane, that it's actually um, going to be more successful in this role. And and there's a there's a trade off because you've got the loiter ability of the biplane, which can fly very slowly and spot things. But then the as they find out that the the advantage of if you get a report from a from a ship or something like that and, and and the aircraft needs to go and check it out it helps if your aircraft is faster and then you you have this situation if you've got a couple of aircraft on patrol and you want them to, to coordinate an attack on a u-boat you, you need one aircraft to be able to get get over to where the other aircraft is relatively quickly um, and the avenger was was just sort of much more successful at this and it, it was able to make a lot more attacks before the U-boats had, had um, headed off than the swordfish were, uh, which again was not to say that the swordfish didn't do a very useful job. It did, but I think the the writing was on the wall at this point that the that the Avenger was actually overall a, a better platform. So with the the war in Europe, the the swordfish's career is is over. What what do you think the legacy of the aircraft is? Because Ferry went to great efforts to make sure one survived which is which is the one that's still flying now isn't it it's or, um, is, or is it is this me sh- it, or showing- is it yes yeah. uh, well ls326 which is the one that fairy saved and it's actually a blackburn built aircraft uh, because by this point there were no fairy built ones about uh, or at least none that i think they could identify but that was the one that, that fairy saved and was their sort of heritage asset and uh, that was sort of continued to fly um, sort of throughout the the fifties, and then was was passed to the Royal Navy. The other one was the one was one which which went to Canada uh, because a lot of swordfish went to Canada and were used in the training role, uh, and was was then acquired by the Strathallan collection, and then by various means got to the the Royal Navy Heritage Flight uh, Navy wings as as it is now. And that's the one that's currently airworthy. I think LS three two six will will be. I think once um, has has had various engine issues, where I think that's um, that's on its way to being returned. So that's the white one, which was which was actually operated off a Mac ship and and uh, and, and wears its its color scheme that it did at the time. 
and you know has, has, has an actual um, frontline history, whereas the the other the other one W five six eight six I think it is five eight five um, six was was um, actually both aircraft were flown by Duncan Mingus, oh, wow. um, which I which I discovered uh, they're 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 both in his logbook. Um, LS three two six when when he picked it up from from Blackburns after the war to to, to deliver it to to, to Ferry and five six eight six I think he briefly flew it it was like a sort of ten minute checkout flight or something like that in fact the Fulmer that was at the fleet that's at the Fleet Air Arm Museum was his personal aircraft so there are there are quite a few you know a surprising number of aeroplanes still around that had, that he had a personal history with so. Um, you know, that's I find that interesting as a, a as a Mingus geek. But, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, the legacy. You asked me about the legacy. Um, I think obviously it was it was realised at the time what an what an important aircraft it was, and even before the aircraft had gone out of service, it, its its importance and its significance and its kind of and its its myth and its legend were were already being built up, and the um, the crew that that flew the last production Swordfish were aware that this was the, the last of the swordfish and the pilot wrote to Blackburns to ask if they could send him some some photographs and some uh, some information about it and there was a ceremony when when this was was handed over and and uh, when it was um, when it flew flew out of, of Sherburn for the last time and yeah it was it was already already by sort of 1944 when the aircraft went out of production its importance was realised and fairies, you know, it, it was very early for the heritage movement, but they, they realised the importance of saving one um, and keeping it in flying condition. I think that's um, that was very sort of far-sighted of them. And f- sort of the wider the wider public, I guess, because we've had the mid-air shows for well, most, most of our lives, I, I suppose, um, and films like Sink the Bismarck. Do you think it's, it's sort of kept it in that, sort of rose tinted public imagination that say maybe not to the degree of the spitfire which is <laughs> over overblown it's the, it's yeah, the spitfire it's, it's, yeah <laughs> but it, it it does have it does have this place in people's hearts and I, is that is that because of the movie or is is it just because we've we've gotten used to seeing it at, at air shows in the summertime that's a really good question um i i think I think its its legend started to be built up during the war. I think I think it did start as early as that, and I think it's it's interesting you 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 raise the, the Spitfire as well because the the Spitfire and the Swordfish are the two aircraft I've found that it's easiest to make people cross about by questioning <laughs> anything about their capabilities or or their career. And I think any any time you try and introduce some sort of nuance to it. And to suggest that these weren't kind of these these sort of perfect aircraft sent to us from the gods to do a perfect job and never do anything wrong, you will upset people, and they 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 tend to be even more some some aircraft like I don't know. Well, nobody nobody ever um, complains about the Lancaster, so I've never I've never seen anything like that happen, or, or the you know the Mustang maybe. Um, but even the, even with the Mustang, I think more it's, it's easier to upset people by saying that the Swordfish was was obsolete. And um, and that it was um, you know it, inadequate for certain roles, which it, it you know by a certain point in the war it undoubtedly undoubtedly was. Um, but yeah, I, I think there is a part of it to the, the whole sink the Bismarck thing, and and so th- there were I think three swordfish assembled for that film. Um, to, at least two of them flew. I can't remember. Maybe two or even three of them were actually it's still a, flying at the yeah, time. It, it's been a while since. In my head, there's 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 a Vic of three, but that might just be me. Mm, no, it, misremembering. It, it, it's um, because I, this NF that aircraft is it was at Leon Solent for years, and it's 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 with Navy Wings now, uh, sort of dismantled. But I think again the the long term aspiration is to, to to rebuild that one but it's um it, it was used as a spare source for the other two for a while which is, is why it's in its sort of somewhat denuded condition now um and ls326 was one of the and that wore its sink the bismarck colors for a long time and i think possibly again the 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 sheer affection with which it was regarded by its crews um is another sort of 
there were you know several kind of memoirs that that came out sort of in the um in the sort of 50s and 60s that that sort of really built on that romance of the of the swordfish in the way that the poor old albacore just didn't get um and uh you know i think that you know i'll defend the albacore till the till the cows come home it it, it, it did a lot more <laughs> than people shocked. give it credit for <laughs> huh? i'm shocked you defend the albacore <laughs> Yeah, no, sorry. It's just yeah, it's it's. it's I'm not going to per- get I'm not going to get you started on the barracuda. No, either. no. I mean, my entire personality <laughs> is basically defending aircraft that other people over uh, right off. But um, it, it's hard to say where it came from and where it grew. But but it, it's just this unlikely, and also I think just the sheer British love of an underdog, um, and, and the sort of unlikely heroics of it. Um, it, it's all just sort of part of that, and obviously the the Bismarck. That's huge, you know. Taranto is, Taranto is kind of. It, it's like the fleet air arms Trafalgar in the way that it, it's treated and the way it's. You know, they they have the Taranto night dinners and so on, and it's 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 regarded in very much the same way. Um, so I think it's difficult to say where that exactly how all that grew up but it's been growing up really since the aircraft since before the aircraft was out of service i believe uh, and um you know it's just just kind of growing and building ever since then i don't know how many other aircraft that were it's you know capable of 130 miles an hour or something like that top speed in the second world war and um covered in fabric and there's a role in the public consciousness for an aircraft of that nature among all the sort of sleek, sleek fighters and pugnacious heavy bombers and things like that. And it's, yeah, more power to it. Matt, this has been great fun. Thanks so much for joining me today. You're very welcome. The Ferry Swordfish was a remarkable aircraft, called upon to do remarkable things and flown by remarkable men. That it has stayed in our consciousness as it has is fantastic. I can't thank Matt enough for joining me to discuss the aircraft because it is one of those ones that whenever you see it does stir the emotions. Whether that's from the movies that we've watched it on or the the stories that we've seen or the fact that it just looks so out of place in a Second World War context, the Swordfish is special. And I have to say, Matt's book, which is out now from Tempest Books, is ace as well. I'm a big fan of Matt's writing. He has an incredible style for conveying a lot of information in a way that you can suck it all in. And I'm not just saying that because he's a mate. Trust me, if it was rubbish, I'd tell you. It's not. Go grab a copy. And of course, if you want a copy, you can grab one from the Boney Broad Bookshop. There's a link in the description below. As always, 10% supports the podcast and bookshop.org will help to support independent bookshops all across the country. I've also put Matt's Duncan Mingus biography, Flying to the Edge, in our bookshop as well, along with his incredible book on the Allison Engine Mustangs, which you can check out our old history hack episode about as well. Links are all in the description below. If you'd like to support the podcast even more, we have a Patreon where you can join from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. We have Discord channels where we can chat about aircraft and you'll be the first to hear about all the great stuff that we have coming up on the show, which I'm really excited about, actually. If you can give us a review as well, that does all the business with the algorithms and that would be amazing. But thank you for listening. And until next time, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone. And it is a Boney Abroad's podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.